Now then, how are you doing? I hope you're well. You know how it is when you wake up one morning and you just fancy painting a snowy mountain summit? Yeah, exactly. The same thing happened to me. And this is what I came up with. I love mountains, me. This is a snowy top from a lofty mountain overlooking Eidfjord in Norway. What I like most about it are its contours. The more you study it, the more you see. At first glance, this would appear to be nothing more than a great slab of rock and a smattering of snow. This relatively small corner of a mountain has many subtle elements, though, that I hope to reveal in my watercolour demonstration. I'm going to start by painting in the sky with a light to medium mix of Prussian blue. I've decided I don't really need to draw the subject out in pencil since the overall shape of the mountain is pretty straightforward and I want the rock details to develop organically. Painting the sky wet onto dry like this does mean I've got to work reasonably quickly though. If I stop halfway through and take too long over mixing further paint, I'm likely to get hard edges or back runs, and the result would probably not be very smooth. If you're working at an angle like me, you must always watch out for the accumulation of paint along the bottom edge of shapes. It's a good idea to lift up the excess with your brush or the corner of a piece of tissue. For the bare rock, I need a suitable natural looking grey. For this, my go-to mix is French Ultramarine and Burnt Umber. If you add Burnt Umber to French Ultramarine, a tiny amount at a time, you'll find the two colours neutralise each other and at some point become a beautiful neutral grey, similar to neutral tint. On this occasion, I've added extra burnt umber, giving it a slightly warmer look, more in keeping with the location. The rock face, with its complex lattice work of snowy ledges and crevasses, is quite a major challenge. In watercolour, we work from light to dark, which means that any highlights need to be left as untouched white paper. There are several ways of approaching this. One way would be to apply masking fluid to all the snowy areas, to protect them from the grey mix, perhaps drawing them out in pencil beforehand. Another Less satisfactory solution would be to paint the mountain without snow and apply it afterwards with white paint. My own personal issue with this is that white paint never looks as clean and bright as the white of the paper. Since I decided I don't want to plan the rock details down to the nth degree, I've rejected both of these solutions for the one that I'm most comfortable with. Negative painting. Now, While this may be a less precise solution than using masking fluid, I'm much happier with it because it gives me the freedom to be a little more spontaneous. Spontaneity is a valuable commodity. My aim is to capture the essence of the snowy mountainside, but I'd rather not have to worry about having to render it with any great precision. The most important thing is to maintain the integrity of the mountain's contours. 
the brush marks need to follow and visually explain those contours. In doing so, they hopefully explain the three-dimensional properties of the hillside. Badly placed brush marks may send out the wrong message. A straight line, for instance, will tell the viewer that a particular area is flat. There's a clearly defined slope, with a few noticeable terraces punctuated by crags and rocks that follow the flow of the mountainside. One important ingredient here is the random element, the creation of which is one of the hardest things we have to do in watercolour painting. It's easy to fall into the trap of creating repetitive patterns. These should be avoided at all cost, along with shapes that are too angular or geometric. The narrow veins of snow cling to ledges that also follow the underlying contours. Between the two of them, the rocks and the negatively painted snow between the mountainside is hopefully starting to take shape. I've increased the intensity of my grey mix by adding more pigment to it, and warmed it up slightly by dropping in a tiny amount of my secret weapon, alizarin crimson. Having established the basic layout of my mountainside, I'm now going to work my way over it again, darkening areas as I go, to pull them out and make them more prominent. What I'm also doing is selectively softening off some of those details to blend them into their surroundings and make them look like they are an integral part of the mountainside and not just plastered over the top of it. It's worth mentioning that I'm using a damp brush for the softening off procedure. Damp, not wet. If the brush is too wet, then the water will simply bleed back into the wash and create backruns or unsightly dark outlines. Another effect of softening off a brush mark is to create a graduation of tone. This helps to give a rock face a more rounded, eroded shape, either concave or convex. My selection of which marks to soften off and which to leave hard-edged is mostly arbitrary. The process is an intuitive one that doesn't come with a rule book. Painting rocks like this is a voyage of discovery. It's important to constantly monitor what happens on the paper, stand back from it often and be prepared to re-evaluate what you see if the paint starts to dictate something different to your original intentions. Watercolour painting is a two-way process, consisting of the artist's vision and nature taking its course. We should always allow ourselves to be surprised by what the paint does despite our best efforts to do otherwise, and try to maintain a positive outlook.
I've mixed up a blue-grey shadow colour from French Ultramarine and Burnt Umber, and I'm applying it to the hillside in the hopes of reinforcing its overall shape and to establish a vague suggestion of where the light might be coming from. As with the darker tones, I'm doing a fair amount of softening off as I go. It's worth noting that applying a wash over the previous washes is also having a tendency to soften off some of those details that I've taken so much care over. Several details have disappeared altogether. Because of that, this can seem like a bit of a scary thing to do. I'm not too worried about it though. For one thing, it helps to inject a hint of unplanned ambiguity to the proceedings. Left as it is, the mountainside is starting to look quite busy anyway, so this is a great way to dial it all down a bit. The other reason I'm not going to fret about it is because once I've finished applying the shadows and left it to dry, I can then go back in there with an even richer, darker mix of colour to exaggerate and enhance selected details. Well, there is an ulterior motive to doing this. Instead of just repainting over every single mark that I've previously painted to make them darker, I'm going to choose which details to exaggerate based on what makes for a more interesting composition. In other words, I can focus on certain areas to try and capture the attention of a casual observer so that they're not overwhelmed by a barrage of detail. Instead, they will hopefully home in on the most interesting parts first before wandering off to explore the rest of the mountainside. Winding ledges and terraces, crags that plummet vertically downwards to snow-filled gullies, cracks, crevasses and partially submerged glacial rocks are all there to be discovered once you start looking closely. For me, this is one of the most exciting things about mountains, second to actually climbing them for real, of course. It isn't until you start looking closely at them and trying to paint them that you realise just how infinitely complex they are. Never underestimate the importance of close observation. Along with practice and perseverance, in watercolour painting it's one of the key ingredients to success.
So there you have it, a snowy mountain top that got more interesting the closer I looked and the longer I spent on it. Well, I hope you enjoyed the demonstration, even if mountains aren't necessarily your thing. The concept of close observation applies to any subject in watercolour. Take the time to really study your subject and you may find hidden depths to it. Until next time. Take care.